I think a lot of the benefit of social media is that uh, the availability of information changes the landscape immensely. You know, I think it's accelerated uh, the opportunity for new technologies to be introduced to the marketplace. I think there's new streams of, uh, of funding uh, that can come through for new technologies that are, are, are coming to the marketplace. And traditionally through the IPO process, it was extremely difficult. One particular uh, company in uh, specifics over the last 18 months that we're going to talk about today, we're going to have the CEO, Mr. Thomas Healy of Hylion Holdings on the channel here. We're going to dive deep into what has unfolded over the last 18 months to be an absolute whirlwind of, of information through the SPAC craze all the way through 2020. Hylion was able to enter into public markets uh, via the SPAC. Uh, via the uh, funding that was made available to accelerate Hylion's uh, technology forward and uh, reach their goal quicker than they could have ever reached uh, without the assistance of public markets. So we're going to have Thomas on. We're going to run through a series of questions that uh, have really, really evolved over the last 18 months on information that was made available during the SPAC process. Uh, and information that investors acted upon uh, through the SPAC process and into the actual IPO of Hylion Holdings, what has transpired uh, since then, uh, and where we are currently here uh, in the beginning of December 2021, entering into 2022, uh, with what has evolved now uh, in the inception of this young company, uh, marked and vast progress. Um, notable delays as well uh, that have been uh, 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 proposed all during a time of a global pandemic that has put uh, an absolute damper on, on so many people and so many people's lives and the productivity that's been made so difficult uh, in everybody's lives uh, by uh, this, this global pandemic. And it continues to persist to this day. But, but at the time of filming this video, we've got um, the uh, supply chain issues that were identified during the Q3 earnings uh, report uh, as being a real systemic uh, factor in the um, Hylion's uh, timelines in when product validation and verification could be made uh, and products could be rolled out to the fleet to start to realize uh, the benefits of and the vision of highly on holdings to reduce the carbon uh, emissions footprint for each and every one of their customers. So I'd like to welcome Thomas Healy on the channel. Thomas, thank you so much for making your way on the Independent Investor Channel. Um, I know that we have uh, been a staunch advocate uh, over the last 18 months of, of your company, of your product, uh, of your vision, and we've been there lockstep, uh, step by step, in all of the new appointees to the board, uh, all of the new uh, uh, additions to the management team, and, and we've been uh, focused on the progress that's been made uh, thus far on the company. So Thomas, thank you so much. I, I'd like to jump into the interview if we could uh, and talk about something that doesn't get talked about very often here, and that's insider selling. When the top guy at a company decides to sell shares, uh, they do so for a number of different reasons. And in, in many cases, um, those reasons are absolutely 100% justified. And I, I, I've had a chance to, to look at your um, uh, sales of stock as of late um, in, in rather large blocks relative to your overall shareholding. Uh, it, it's, it's really kind of insignificant. Uh, and there absolutely might be some uh, some tax purposes as to why those prearranged sales uh, were put through. But what ends up happening is when you have a stock that is at all time lows and you have the goings on at a company from the top guy, which the chief executive officer is the top guy continually selling shares and providing that optic to the marketplace there's no way of spinning it other than that you do not believe in your product. Thomas, care to give some insight on how you uh, wish the market would perceive these stock sales, sales by insiders uh, at the company? 
All right, fantastic. Hearing nothing. We'll move on to, and we'll stay on insider selling, actually. I was able to do some um, some research on who was picking up shares of highly on holdings. Now, while institutions have increased um, their institutional um, uh, grip on highly on holdings here, bu buying at basically bottom dollar or rock bottom prices, was interesting to see some of the insiders just over the last 18 months as the SPAC process expired away and the company entered into public markets, how a number of executives or original investors have sold out of the company. They're long gone. Furthermore, those individuals who picked up large blocks of shares, 100 share blocks uh, of shares, they did so at pennies on the dollar. They bought them for nine cents. And so a lot of them put a token amount up to receive blocks of 100 shares uh, only to sell on the open market. Uh, and in a lot of cases below uh, the actual IPO price and and the implied uh, uh, value of the company of 1.5 billion, um, which puts about a, a, a fair value of the company at around ten dollars a share. Uh, it, what what's interesting to me as well, speaking about the optics of those insider sh sh sells, and, and the people who were there at the onset to think it better to sell the shares um, that they had entered into at nine cents as part of the deal and move on and not really share in the vision that Hylion has as so many retail investors and institutional investors are doing right now. And as we speak, the stock sits at an all time low. So where those individuals in very, very specific cases were provided a neon green parachute to parachute nicely out of Hylion, we were brought to public markets based on a lot of information that was put forward, invested upon, and all the while these folks were leaving through the back door on their sweetheart deals. Thomas, care to comment um, on the, the structure and what it's meant holistically for the funding that has been made available through public markets to Hylion to advance their product and why it is that you think in those particular cases, those individuals decided to jump ship, to, to leave, uh, to leave on a high note or in in all reality sell out of their shares to move on to a better day thomas care to care to comment all right fantastic hearing nothing we'll move on to the next question here i want to get right into the investor presentation not the new one but the old one the original investor presentation that was uh, made available to investors um, this document was scrutinized up and down um, a lot of people looked at a lot of the customers that you guys had already been doing business with and still do business with today. Uh, so kudos on that. Um, one particular slide in particular, which talked about the sales projections into the future. I want to get a little bit more uh, into this. And we knew that uh, Hylion ran a capital lean structure uh, in that if you could partner with the OEM hubs, which will be another question that we talk about here shortly, that you could turn out mass volumes of your product without really having to produce the product to yourself and to a, a lot of original investors. They looked at the forecast into 2025, capturing you know, just a, a couple percent of the total overall addressable market that Hylion was going after, potential sales of $2.2 billion. Margins at that point anticipated to stretch to about 35%, which were sweet enough uh, to look at. My question here, 18 months after that original uh, investor presentation was rolled out, none of that has come to, to reality, none of it. It's looking like the projections, there's 100% certainty that you will not meet those sales projections on that. Furthermore, it, it, it seems as if there is also question about the merit and credibility of those disclosures that were actually submitted to the SEC uh, at the time of the presentation being released, there was a lot of people that made investment decisions based on those projections. My question to you, Thomas, is very, very simple. Where did the projections come from? Did the projections come from an educated guess? Did they come from just a guess? Did they come from hard lane data and metrics? Did they come from 
discussion with industry to understand what was practical and re reasonable uh, uh, with regard to your customer needs and what you could realistically deliver into the future. You guys called for in 2025, uh, a production number of around 15,000 Hypertruck ERXs. You called for a production amount of uh, 15,000 uh, hybrid EXs. And what's transpired over the last 18 months that's really, really difficult to swallow sometimes is the salt pill and understanding that neither one of those uh, two products were in a final state to make those types of projections on an investor presentation that was put forward to get everybody excited about investing in your company. And it worked. The stock shot to $58 based on these projections. I'll highly and I'll have no problem grabbing 2% of the total overall addressable market. They don't have to dominate the landscape. If they can just do what is being uh, proposed as anemic numbers, surely in four years from the time of the initial SPAC rollout, they'll be able to realize in some capacity those numbers. What we've learned is that just shy of two years later, those numbers will not be met. And furthermore, there might not be any actual realization of those numbers at any foreseeable time into the future. So, so my question is based on integrity and merit. When those uh, numbers were rolled out and those projections were made to the investor class out there, was it to be understood that those were just educated guesses at the time? Or were those understood to be projections based on hardline data, statistics, and analytics uh, drawn from the industry that you're looking to partner with. Thomas, care to comment? All right, fantastic. Hearing nothing, I think that leaves investors uh, open to speculation. Let's move on to the next topic here. The, the lack of outreach has been appalling. Um, you, during the SPAC process, were on uh, a number of different social media platforms. You were on uh, CNBC multiple times, actually. Um, it was great to see. You were out there. You actually rang the bell at the uh, New York Stock Exchange, a place that I personally have been to twice. So I probably got you beat there personally um, in actually going inside the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But it was great to see that outreach, uh, photo shoots and photo ops in front of the New York Stock Exchange um, with Wegmans. I thought that uh, carried a lot of weight. Um, I, I thought the formulation of the Innovation Council the, the formulation of the board, the culmination of your upper management has just been spot on. It's been absolutely fabulous. It's one of those things that I give you a lot of credit for is building out the framework of the team, um, expanding up to 150 ex uh, employees with the company. Um, my understanding and my direct communication almost uh, very frequently with uh, Lewis Baltimore, who's head of investor relations, who does a fabulous job um, getting information to me. Um, as quickly and timely as he can, as busy as he is, does a great, great job. Um, my criticism of the company is the lack of transparency as of late. And after the Q3 earnings report and before, there was 45 days of silence. Okay, a 30-day uh, quiet period before earnings is totally understood. And you guys have done a really good job of strategically dropping uh, information that was uh, publicly discernible during that time frame in previous earnings report thought that was really smart. But silence on the line for 45 days before the Q3 earnings report made a lot of investors think that you guys were working on something big. And there was an anticipated buildup in the stock price going into the Q3 earnings. They must be working on something. This idea is revolutionary. It's groundbreaking. A lot of uh, investors um, feel the same way about your guys' prospects into the future, right? So the buildup was enormous. But to fall on deaf ears the way that it did in the Q3 earnings and the Monet order of 40 uh, uh, Hypertruck ERXs fell on deaf ears because it just wasn't enough to uh, overshadow uh, um, some of the things that were highlighted during the report. Um, I thought releasing the earnings report at 8.05 when nobody could make a move after hours based on that report was um, extremely unprofessional. Um, and it's just not what public markets do. It's not what public companies do in public markets. Um, and and it, it seems to me that the perception is such that you guys did that uh, purposely 
Uh, and if you care to comment on that, you're certainly welcome to do so. But but more so, I, I think the concern right now is the lack of uh, forward-leaning information. It seemed to dry up. Now, if you're so busy that you're working on changing the world every single day behind the scenes, no problem. Just come out and say that. If you're too busy to go to the expanded facility and take an iPhone shot, uh, no problem. Uh, let me know. I'll fly down on my own dime and do it myself. It's no problem. Okay. There's absolutely people out there that are willing to help Hylion Holdings in their cause. Drive Mix Game is one of those absolute people that do it. A real truck driver um, on, on the ground floor that's actually speaking so highly of your product that there's people out there that are willing to help. But I think the perception is that silence is the killer. And at all time lows, I don't think there's any way of actually disputing that assessment to the company, even though those presumptions might be off base and we may understand. Them. So my question with regard to the uh, break from November 9th after the Q3 earnings, it took about three weeks to turn out the Wegmans video, which was fabulous. We need more of that content. But <clears throat> my question is is to a, to a grander per perception. Are, are you guys focused on the right stuff? Because if it's going to take three weeks to get a, a video out, on a, a company that you're supposed to be very, very tight with and lockstep with. At the time of filming this video, we've heard nothing. Um, almost going on a month after that meeting. Um, no reservation orders, which are non-binding and mean absolutely nothing in the eyes of the marketplace. But we've received even nothing of the sort. So we have to make sure that the information that's being pushed forward to would-be investors is being made readily available when it's available, and you have a complete department that is in head, uh, ahead of investor relations and outreach. And we have heard nothing outside of the Wegmans video through press releases since November 9th. Care to comment on the perceived lack of communication on behalf of Hylion Holdings to the shareholders directly? All right, fantastic. Just as anticipated, no comment on the line. We really appreciate your transparency there, Thomas. Let's get into the next question here. Where does driving shareholder value fall on your priority list? And what does driving shareholder value mean to you? The shares right now are trading at an all-time low. Um, I don't think that that's reflective of the prospects of Hylian Holdings. I think anybody who's bull, uh, bullish on the company and um, looking into the future and having some sort of vision as to where you guys could potentially go into the future um, uh, understands that there is a disconnect between the uh, company perspectives uh, and the stock price now. But up up to now, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over and again and, and, and expecting different results, okay? And I, I think as of now, it, we've been doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And the stock is not buying it. Uh, neither is the stock market. Um, neither is anybody on the Innovation Council, I might add. So if, if we start to align these realities, is the stock market really that off on where in the eyes of the stock market they see the value proposition in Hylion? And where does your job as the CEO to step up and look to defend that shareholder value come into play, if at all? Thomas, please. Shareholder value, Thomas. Right. Right. Okay. Hearing nothing. Fantastic. We have six bullets left until we get to zero. So hopefully we can use those uh, six bullets that we have left uh, to fire at the stock market um, as useful as we can, bridging the gap between now, latter 2021, going into 2022 with no projected ramp up of mass uh, scale production at all uh, and the unknowns about what potential revenue could be garnered into 2022, uh, bridging us to that um, all, um, all sacred 2023 
where we're supposed to have orders that are supposed to be ramping up and this customer acceptance that we've discussed over the last 18 months and demand over your product is to somehow come uh, come into fruition uh, and stop being a discussion and more of a reality, okay? So driving shareholder value, uh, it's one of those things that uh, I discuss a lot with a lot of the CEOs that are willing enough to come on my channel and, and actually talk about it. It means a lot to the real dollars. You know, there is no real difference between the institutional dollars and the retail dollars that are invested in highly on holdings. You want to know why? They're all dollars and they all own stock in your company. And to provide some sort of transparency to both of those entities, I, I think is absolutely paramount. And I actually would put it number one. If you don't want to have the responsibility of driving shareholder value, no problem. Take the company private. You, you can take the company private, drive the Hypertruck ERX that's been paid for through SPAC dollars all you want, no problem. But as a publicly traded entity, you owe it to drive shareholder value. And silence on the line is, is not a solution. It is not a solution to remedy the stock at an all-time price low right now. Okay. Next on the list here is industry adoption and OEM. To be honest with you, Thomas, I was one of those investors that did due diligence. I was one of those investors that um, got into the company prospects. I got into what was proposed um, through the, uh, the through the public uh, identifiable information and what was submitted to the SEC through the SPAC process. My interest to the company basically was your um, business model of using the OEM, the OEM hubs specifically to integrate with said OEMs to turn out your product in a way that didn't require you guys to establish yourselves as an OEM yourselves and have to manufacture these products. Very difficult to do. It takes decades to establish the relationships to get these, um, the, you know, the, the right amount of, of standards um, that are written into each and every one of these chassis that are rolled off the line, um, the equipment deals. Um, the deals that are written over time to actually cut into um, those, um, uh, those 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 profits and and reduce those uh, increase those margins for the OEMs uh, over the years as they establish those relationships, which is really difficult to do. So the the the, the amazing idea was to to partner with some of these OEMs. Um, th there's been some interesting uh, uh, developments with regard to your relationships with some of the original stakeholders. Um, Dana specifically, and I'd like to understand a little bit more about Dana's involvement in, are they just friends of yours? Are they, are they in um, the highly on vision uh, anymore? Are they completely cut out of, of the vision altogether? And where does Peterbilt uh, fit in this as what I deem to be the only OEM that you have right now to be able to accept uh, mass scale orders now? If, in fact, we get these supply chain issues taken care of sooner than later, you guys are just wagging out there that it's going to be 12 months. It could be eight. It could be six. Are you prepared to start to accept a windfall of orders and run it through what I perceive to be the one OEM relationship that you have? And it seems to be a very, very good one. Don't lose it. It seems like you're the, that's the only one you have. But some of the o other OEM uh, manufacturers, uh, Volvo, uh, Freightliner, some of the other ones, where is the progress and discussion with these OEMs? Is the expectation to win over customers and then have that customer demand of their specific OEMs drive the demand indirectly for Hylion? Um, Where is the progress with regard to the OEM hubs, which I haven't heard you mention since the Q2 earnings report in 2021. Thomas, care to, care to, care to comment on the progress that we're making with the OEMs and the OEM hubs uh, vision for mass scale up uh, of the Hylion solution? All right, fantastic. Hearing nothing, we'll continue to speculate on that front. Uh, next uh, item is product validation. And, and I really want to coin this to what we have on the books right now. Uh, to my count, 1,590 um, impressive reservation order book. That order book has um, sporadically evolved over the last 18 months of the company, starting off right out of the gate with a home run. A home run. 
Okay. Right out of the gate, you get a thousand agility uh, uh, orders, which there was a submission to the SEC, which actually relinquished all agility's responsibilities to honor uh, any uh, of that initial 1000 uh, hyper truck ERX order commitment that they made. And I think at the time there was so much uh, positive sentiment around the stock that people actually chalked up that uh, as positive, just like they have given you the benefit of the doubt uh, up till now uh, on the company in that, look, we want to make sure that other companies have a fair shake at this. In other words, we need to make sure that the companies have a chance to validate said product. And if there's something there that they don't like, that they have the opportunity to walk away. In other words, your company's solution should stand on its own and it should sell itself. They shouldn't be stuck with a binding pre-order um, that they can't get out of if they find that the product is not what they signed up uh, to commit to. Okay. My question uh, now, Thomas, at the end of 2021 here, has that order, specifically the agility order, died on the vine? Is it still just as credible the day that it was inked? And has there been any progress toward solidifying any of those initial reservation order books to letters of intent? Um, and I say that because if on the onset, before the Hypertruck ERX was even validated, and before the uh, EX uh, hybrid was revamped um, on market time, I might add, ha has, has there been a significant change in Agility's eyes having inked that pre-order so long ago? And I say that because the excitement around the Hypertruck ERX has not really dwindled. That's been made um, apparent by the last Monet order th that has come through the on the books. And so there, there's interest around the product. We know that. But it's only a non-binding pre-order. In other words, there has been no uh, uh, announced letters of intent, which your competition is actually selling trucks right now, which is an interesting um, contrast between you guys saying that it's going to be 12 months and it, we're not going to be able to sell a truck until then. But you've got your competition out there actually delivering both Hyzon and Nikola are, are both delivering. Tesla has just solidified and delivered um, and, 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 um, and solidified that order for a hundred trucks with Pepsi, which is an interesting one right under your nose because your CFO used to work for them. So I find that interesting how the value proposition on paper with Hyleon seems to blow the competition right out of the water. But in reality, these folks over here are eating your lunch with binding orders um, that uh, came up over the last couple of years. And now companies are feeling like they've got the green light to go with stepping into either an all electric future or an electrified uh, future using the uh, solution that you guys bring to bear. But I think the interest for a lot of investors is surrounding what we took at face value um, many, many times over, the stock at an all-time low has us now questioning the merits of each of those proposals that were made uh, publicly discernible uh, at the time of the SPAC, okay? A lot of interest garnered around the idea. Uh, a lot of um, hype, to be honest with you, went into this. And when a, hi a thousand hypertruck order comes on the onset, it seems to imply that orders that are going to come into the future are going to actually uh, continue. And we're going to continue to win those hyper truck orders, which at the time, again, we're, we're not, we're binding um, and, and have since come off as non binding. So it should be a lot easier for companies to electively put their, uh, their, their uh, reservations forward in a non binding fashion and basically just solidify their position in the queue. This is why I don't understand why Wegmans didn't ink the deal right then and there. At the very least, at the very least, a reservation of 100 ERXs. They could have thrown that out and had no legal obligation at all to fulfill that order. Where we are as of now, Thomas, do you care to update us on the progress that's being made to Wegmans?
All right, fantastic. Hearing nothing, I can expect that uh, that order is actually in the works right now and that you just can't talk about that um, on an interview during a social media presence. Totally understand that. Uh, we'll be standing by for future uh, progress on the Wegmans deal, uh, which seemed to be a slam dunk when you guys went up there and talked about um, providing your solution to them. Uh, and having provided this solution to them uh, previously through your CNG hybrid product. Product validation is a big one. We've thrown out a couple of numbers, and this was, again, identified in the investor presentation from Hell. Um, you guys don't make that available through your website, but you can find it open source um, on Google. I saved it, actually, the day that it came out. Um, so I would have that information to fall back on um, just in case the highly unlikely um, uh, occurrence was that highly Holdings could not meet the projections that were made forward to investors uh, in those presentations. 120 on the CNG side. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the competition on the landscape and seeming seemingly there was a, a report or a concern on the Q3 that the Cummins uh, natural gas engine was somehow going to eliminate uh, altogether the hybrid EX product that you guys have spent an enormous amount of time and money on validating and putting to marketplace. And then two months later, um, basically putting your tail between your legs um, and, and cowering into a corner to competition that a lot of people in industry are telling me it's unvalidated. In, in other words, there's no way that a, a natural gas truck can supplement that 120 of horsepower that you guys contend that you can absolutely provide to the fleets. Case in point, Detmar Logistics. They're doing it right now. There's no better product validation than having the hybrid unit running frack sands uh, in, in the, on the sandy roads uh, in South Texas for Detmar Logistics and providing that bottom dollar benefit uh, to the horsepower side of the house uh, in in um, in assistance of the uh, typical uh, lack of horsepower in CNG units. Okay, the next is the thirty uh, percent fuel savings. We've failed to provide any type of ground truthing of the thirty percent hybrid savings. The hybrid units were rolled out through three companies up in the northwest. My old home. There was never any statistics released except for they liked the product. They liked the product. That's a nice way of saying, thank you for allowing us to use your product free of charge, but we're not interested. That's what it means in the business world. Now, if it truly provided them 30% fuel savings, which that number has gone all over the place, it's gone from 30% all the way down to 6%, I've heard. So what is it? Is it just an, an interesting green box? that's being put on the tractor itself only to provide 6% on the minimum to challenging terrains out there? Um, or is it the 30% that was originally uh, disclosed uh, to investors uh, as being the fuel savings, okay? The um, uh, short seller report that came out challenged the notion of this. And at the time, we just over blew it and said, no way, Hylion's on the on the up. There's no way that they would lie to us about the hybrid um, uh, EX's potential on the diesel side for fuel savings. There's no way, there's no way, there's no way. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a way or there is a way. But right now with the stock at an all-time low, everything is getting scrutinized with regard to the credibility and the merit of those said projections back then. And I've seen nothing in defense of those, uh, of, of those particulars and uh, potentials of those products from highly on holdings since then. Um, care to offer any uh, granularity around the 1,000 miles that the Hypertruck ERX is supposed to get, the hybrid diesel and the hybrid CNG on their potentials and how you guys have been able to internally validate that you guys can hit the numbers. All right, very well. Hearing nothing, thank you. We'll be standing by uh, for that uh, information there on product uh, validation. I've got an interesting and a serious question. This is one from my own personal archive, Thomas. Was highly on holdings ready to go to public markets? Do you think that uh, highly on came to uh, public markets too soon? Was your product, was it 
uh, disclosed to investors as being more ready than it actually was before you came to public markets? Now, see, obviously, for my viewers, Thomas Healy doesn't have the opportunity to respond to this. The, 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 the difficulty in a lot of these questions that I um, am asking Thomas Healy right now, I would not ask him in person because the political correctness right now in the marketplace is enough to make me puke. OK, it really is. These, these are not off the wall questions. These are not. Was the, was the SPAC process a lottery ticket for Thomas Healy as disclosed? Thomas Healy wins the SPAC lottery by bringing his, his company to public markets only to continue with uh, spending that money on verification, uh, product development, uh, being uh, subject to uh, supply chain issues, only to further delay what could have been avoided in the first place by coming to markets um, a little bit later after they were ready. Uh, but that's not how it was pitched to investors at all. It was pitched to mean that the opportunity opened up, the SEC allowed it, which I, I don't think they should have ever allowed this debacle to unfold. Um, too many people got hurt by it. Um, and there was opportunity to provide companies that I, I think that they shouldn't have been provided opportunity. If you want to go traditional IPO, no problem. Um, but uh, highly on holdings got into the public markets via the SPAC process. And uh, we are looking for uh, 2022 as really being that stop gap and bridge between what is now an all time low stock price uh, in the highly on stock uh, price um, as compared to what is supposed to be going on at the companies uh, producing a carbon free uh, vision for the future and becoming better for the planet uh, by partnering with some of the largest institutions out there um, that are also lockstep in this mission. Okay. Uh, the next is integrity and credibility. In When the stock price goes down to all time lows, they start to question the integrity and the credibility of the company. So I, I want to ask you just outright, outright is, is, is highly on a credible company, Thomas? Fair enough, hearing none. Um, I did actually ask this question of Lewis Baltimore, and he gave me a fantastic answer. He said, you know, the mood at Hylion is positive. It's it's good. It's it's a great place to work. People love working there. I've heard actually from the Detmar CEO that the Hylion headquarters um, in, in Austin is um, a state-of-the-art facility. It's fantastic, right? And I think it's unfortunate that as a publicly traded company, all too often the stock gets judged based on the company and or the company in this case gets judged by the stock and at all time lows you're probably incurring scrutiny um, that uh, no human being on this earth uh, should be subjected to but at the same time you are a publicly traded company and when we start to look at the credibility of the information that was disclosed through the roadmap through commercialization and mass scale ramp up into 2024 and 2025 with numbers that I, I question whether whether or not those were just educated guesses or they were from credible metrics drawn up from the industry that you are sworn to serve, and that is your customers. And entering into the public forum, I would say shareholders as well. You are charged to, uh, to um, align yourself with that um, uh, and taking the high road in all cases which is in line with some of your company governance uh, and, and company objectives and goals and vision for the future, I might add. Okay. But the integrity and credibility starts to be called into question when we start to look at those investor presentations and, and some of the milestones are met. Yes. But at the same time, when you see orders of, of agility show up on the original and you, 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 you see that same order um, on the books, some 18 months later, the perception is that it's dying on the vine and that the credibility and the impact that it had on the onset to get you through the SPAC process is now not holding as much water in the public markets, obviously, because the stock market is calling BS. They're basically calling BS on the on the highly on orders that have came through. Now, I don't know what type of behind the scenes agreements happened. 
Uh, Sultan Zarek, the CEO of Agility, has always been a staunch advocate of Hylion Holdings from the very beginning. And they have deep pockets. The ability to just wag out there a thousand hyper truck order to make it look good because Hylion uh, uh, presumed that they would incur scrutiny for not having any sales. Well, there you go. That supplemented the ability of Hylion to win sales when, when it was actually awarded at the time to garner that much more interest in the, uh, the opportunity and to soften any scrutiny that they may have to, um, uh, to, as to the interest in the product. They can point to that thousand orders and be like, man, this is getting us off the launching pad right here. They've been able to garner said orders since then, and they've all gone down since then. Uh, 250, 300 from Detmar, uh, 250 from A&G, and this last one from Monet of 40. This is a non-binding reservation order from an existing customers. If this is the best that we can possibly do, it's very, very difficult to make the, the, the value proposition to shareholders out there to say that the cre credibility and the merit of Hylion Holdings is just as high now as it was then. Thomas, what am I getting wrong in that assessment right now in the marketplace? And please assure our shareholders to understand that the goings on behind the walls of Hylion are a lot like Lewis would suggest, that it's a wonderful place to work and you guys are absolutely marching toward that vision of changing the future. All right, fantastic. Hearing nothing, we'll be stuck with uh, making those presumptions on our own uh, and monitoring the stock price as it absolutely is reflecting of what is going on in Hylion Holdings as the hype has dissolved away and the actual results are coming into question whether or not you can meet your milestones that were previously projected to investors in the past. All right. Do we run the risk of being delisted? It was a big deal when you were added to the Russell 2000 and the Russell 1000. It was a big deal. Um, when you came to public markets, it was a big deal. Trading on the New York Stock Exchange, big deal. Um, do we run the risk of be becoming delisted? Um, like I said, we have six bullets left to fire away until we're on the pink sheets. So um, acting with a sense of urgency right now uh, would probably be in everybody's best interest. Um, the silence on the line, uh, coupled with a, a, a lack of acknowledgement to the investor community that you are charged with serving, really only um, it really only just um, exacerbates the situation now in what we're looking at um, with people actually questioning whether or not you guys can continue to survive in the marketplace. It's fairly obvious that there are interested parties out there. Um, the short sellers have been on you like vultures since the beginning. And you have been provided no said protection from those short sellers, short interest back up to about 24% at the time of shooting this video. My, my question is, are you allowing your company to become delisted or even worse um, at the expense of these pressures in the marketplace? Um, did you not adequately forecast that those pressures would be put on the company on the onset? And, and, and furthermore, what is, what is your, what is your, posture at this point in combating that pressure that is being uh, openly put on the company uh, and the questions of whether or not you guys can actually survive um, 2022 with no real projected sales until 2023 or beyond because of some sort of winter validation that could have happened before with your existing unit uh, on the company. Furthermore, I would add that these certifications and validations are not being mentioned by any of your competitors. They're not being mentioned. Um, they're, they're not being mentioned as, as a, a primary focus. All they're focused on is selling trucks and generating revenue. That's it. Which, quite honestly, if you could refocus your uh, uh, vision uh, instead of mating, making a well-laid and produced video from Wegmans, Perhaps maybe the focus does need to change and maybe you guys are right, trying to redefine insanity at this point by doing the same thing over and over again. For me personally, as a shareholder, I don't, I don't sense any type of urgency on your part.
And that's why I asked the question that I do. Do you have the um, potential of being delisted and or will Hylion Holdings survive as a company with what we know now and what we know about where you're going into the future? Thomas? Fantastic. Hearing nothing, we'll move on to our final comment here. And this has a lot to do with what was said about competition and the hybrid EX product that I was super excited about. I did a lot of research. I was skeptical at the beginning, and I came around to understanding that this could be a phenomenal solution for existing fleets out there. It could be a phenomenal solution for existing CNG trucks. The companies, as specific as Wegmans, are relying on um, to haul goods, but they have not been able to uh, um, um, supplement for the lack of horsepower that is generated by the CNG engine uh, on board. That's why you came out, guys came out with the solution. And I was super disappointed. This was the most disappointing part of the earnings call. I didn't even think it needed to be there. It, there are certain things that do not need to be disclosed to shareholders who cares about the competition? Furthermore, why would you name the competition as something that needs to be monitored in the landscape and allow the marketplace to perceive that to mean that the hybrid EX is dead on arrival? The company had just turned out that hybrid product not two months before and made it available to customers out there. And you took minutes out of an earnings report on Q3 that you knew was going to be detrimental to the stock and to the company and to the timelines and projections going forward. And you mentioned a company in the in a light that basically put them on a pedestal and that you guys needed to yield to the competition and just let Cummins go ahead and just uh, grab all the market share in the market in supplementing for um, the lack of horsepower. They are going after the same market that we were going after. Therefore, we have to cease to exist I don't understand that approach at all. I don't understand. You, you have to be more competitive than that. You can't just acknowledge and say, yeah, it's unverified and we will be monitoring it into the future. But there's truck drivers that are coming back saying, no, that's not right. Cummins is just saying that to put out a more uh, reliable and, and a, a, a more um, a, a, an engine into the marketplace that is traditionally able to offer more horse, horsepower than they've historically historically been able to to offer to the marketplace. That's all. It doesn't mean that Hylion's hybrid has to go away. It doesn't mean that because you talk to a few customers that are only existed in the Hypertruck ERX, that nobody else in the marketplace is interested in the hybrid EX product. It doesn't mean that. And it, it absolutely shoots confidence. It, it absolutely quells any type of momentum that you've built up. It absolutely questions where it is that you guys are putting your money into research and development because you guys spend a fortune of, of many, many road miles validating the EX product. And what I as a shareholder want to see in the marketplace is fight, fight. I don't understand where the lack of sense of urgency comes from. I, I don't get it. You need to be fighting right now. Because sooner or later, you're going to wake up and you're not going to have a company in a lot of different forms or fashions. You're going to drive sentiment so low that the institutions are going to start to jump ship. You think it's painful now? Wait till institutions start to drop you after you're delisted from the major indexes. All right? And I don't sense that there's any type of urgency that is being placed on the, the, the situation right now in putting out what a lot of investors, not myself included, are considering to be a dumpster fire. And furthermore, it seems like the solution as of now is to go silent on the line. And silence is probably exacerbating the situation and probably allowing so much speculation to happen to where the truth is being so misconstrued by the goings-on behind the scenes at Hylion, and it was all preventable, all of it. It was all preventable. Thomas, I'd like to thank you for coming on the channel and conducting this interview. I've been asking for the interview for about 12 months now. Um, there was no uh, money involved with this. You guys spent $17 uh, million, uh, last quarter on research and development. Where has it got you? Where, where was it spent? What are some of the strategic initiatives that you're looking to get out of that? 
and you just came on and you probably talked to thousands and thousands and thousands of investors in your company that has faith in the vision, just like they did from the beginning, all the way up until the time of filming this video. All we want to see is transparency and communication. We understand that there are things out of your control. We understand that you're a brand new company. We understand that product verification and validation takes time. We understand a lot more than retail investors are given credit for understanding. There's no doubt about it. But there's a statement to throw a bone every now and then. And to come on the channel with the Independent Investor Channel, who's put out 32 videos on Hylion, all free, all because of something genuine other than money, which is what drives the dialogue many, many of the times. I understand the Wegmans video had to be polished, but that's not what investors are looking for. Investors are looking for some insight on how Hylion aims to separate itself from the industry. Separate it, not compete with. We know there's going to be competition, but we're not investing in the competition. We're investing in Hylion Holdings based on the vision, based on the lean business plan, based on the projections, although delayed, yes, and questioned on this interview. Uh, it has been put forward. We're there with you. And I think coming on means a lot to investors. Keep up the good work, Thomas, behind the scenes. Keep on driving that vision. Don't be a stranger to the channel. You're welcome here anytime. Really appreciate you taking these well uh, well uh, planned uh, 60 minutes and coming on and offering some transparency on some very, very difficult questions on the goings on at a very, very young 18 month old highly on holdings. Thomas, thank you so much. All the best to you. Happy holidays. And we'll be uh, following your company intimately into 2022. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. So fantastic. I'd love to thank Thomas Healy. I'd love to thank uh, Lewis for arranging that. Uh, fantastic. Um, I'm a bull. Like, I don't give a shit what barriers you put in front of me, man. I will bull right through them. Okay. Now, investor relations has actually in ignored uh, my, my emails. Lewis is the only one, man. And I sense frustration in his um, uh, tone with me as well. And it's all justified. All right. But it gives no reason at all to where investor, which I am one, and relations garners a non-response from uh, investor relations, okay? There's one other point to contact on there I will not name by name. My ask of you, if you've stayed with me for the totality of this video, is to take and share, attach to an email, investor relations at Hylion, okay? It's IR uh, at Hylion.com. Very, very simple. Um, if you care in this initiative, I've done everything I can possibly do in my power to garner up the right amount of conversation. Um, I've already sent out a tweet on, Twitter's, uh, on Twitter on Hylion's behalf. Um, I've made a, a, a personal um, um, initiative to help in any capacity that I can to try to educate, to try to get the word out on Hylion Holdings and the opportunity that exists therein. And I will not sit by as an investor with relations with the company and be ignored. I will not do that. So I will continue to press until Hylion Holdings realizes that they are involved in a situation that requires a sense of urgency. It's just that simple. It requires a sense of urgency. And I spend a lot of my personal time, and I don't work for Hylion. I have about six other jobs in my life. This is just one of them that I do for free. I do for free. And to acknowledge an open invitation of Hylion Holdings to have Thomas Healy or any of the other executives on the channel, I've invited Lewis Baltimore on the channel. He knows that that is an open invitation. I have invited uh, uh, Matt Detmar on to try to provide some level of understanding of this product and understanding why the initial projections that were made on the company do have merit. They do have credibility. This solution does work when put into the rigor of over-the-road class eight long-haul trucking. It works. So come on and explain it then, okay? I do a lot of my time explaining what it is that I see with the vision of this company. But sometimes I question whether or not you guys have a strong vision of your own company that, that I do as a shareholder. Guys, if you appreciate the information, you want to make sure and subscribe to the channel. My ask of you is to become part of the movement, 
email investor relations, very, very simple. Copy this, share it with them, do whatever you've got to do to bring them into the, um, the sense of urgency camp because they need to start being more transparent with what's going on. I don't care if they film the parking lot at this point. I don't care. At this point, if they filmed the parking lot at Highly on Holdings, the stock would probably go up 2 or 3% because the marketplace is bone dry, bone dry with thirst on needing information. And it seems like the solution, as far as the last two months have been concerned, has been providing zero transparency to, to shareholders. And I'm not talking about the Wegmans video, and I'm not talking about the earnings report. I'm talking about direct communications from investor relations to let investors know what is going on behind the scenes. Guys, leave your comments, share the video with any highly on investors out there that you know need to have this information in their hands. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the totality of this Thomas Ely interview exclusive on the Independent Investor Channel. Guys, good luck in your investment future.